the shrimp tank When it take a swim, only option is to win In the murky water, not a thought of giving in Welcome to the shrimp tank Want to put it all together, this is big things Doing big things, chasing big dreams Yeah, it's all real, this life's all that it seems All the chicks scream, all the dudes yell This just what I do and I do it well With the flow fresher than the new shoe smell Going through hell, but homie keep going You know the saying, you can reap what you're sowing so, so I don't chase girls, I just chase dreams Play the same game, but we ain't in the same league Running a campaign, roadie 2016 Like a phone to die, put me in charge I'm a general, from the front, I'ma lead the charge Like a federal, fell on my lap, never Hey everybody, you're in for a treat today. We are going to learn all about Stretch Zone, how they franchise, how they got to 130 different locations all across the United States. But first, this is the Oz Digital Studio where we film the Boca Raton Shrimp Tank in collaboration with the FAU Adam Center for Entrepreneurship. We find the do's and don'ts for running businesses down here in South Florida and across the United States. And this episode, it's going to be great. Find out everything about franchising. So I am excited because Kevin, you know, just came out with his second edition over here at the Adam Center I just saw on social media. And you have all about franchises in that book that you guys wrote with, you know, Dr. Kidwell. So tell us a little bit about this book, Kevin. Oh, yeah. New Venture Launchpad 2.0. It's the second version of our workbook. I like to call it a workbook because I, I gave textbooks a really hard time over the years by saying that textbooks for entrepreneurship were no good because they were always outdated and boring and way too long. And then, you know, somebody kept kept trying to encourage me to, you know, you, you can't talk down about all these other books. Like, what do you use? And I was like, I got a bunch of PowerPoints and mostly stuff in my head. And they're like, yeah, well, you can't really expand that and grow that. And, and you can only teach so many people yourselves. You should really kind of organize it all and put it together. So we put a kind of an interactive workbook to run through the, uh, the content. So what am I going to learn from this book if I take the time to read it, Kevin? Well, absolutely everything you're going to need. But what you need to do is, you know, combine it with an entrepreneurship boot camp. Ah, right? September. Teaching gotcha. Well, the one coming up. Yeah. As opposed to like a traditional book, it's not meant to be read and understood sort of on your own in your house, uh, in your library, whatever. Um, it's, it's to be used in person, actively engaged, right? The best way to learn about entrepreneurship is do entrepreneurship. It's really the only way, if you ask me. So that's the way the book is working book is organized and tell us about the boot camp coming up i might join i i i hear nothing but great things about you know a lot of the networking how you could take you know your business and the people in the classroom just share what you're up to and then they're giving amazing feedback i look at of course what you're teaching them but also just the networking for such a low cost such a great value yeah, absolutely. We do the entrepreneurship boot camp every fall, spring, and now summer. We did it this summer for the first time. It's a comprehensive educational program for any entrepreneurs who are looking to start their business, whether it's a lifestyle entrepreneur, you really want to scale something or commercialize a new technology, right? We get faculty in there. We have incredible technology coming out of their their labs, and sometimes they're well-suited candidates for the National Science Foundation's um, i core program which can be added on to the boot camp and that gives uh founders access to a couple thousand dollars to do customer development that's pretty cool and what's going on with fau are they having students come back on campus in a couple weeks well they think they are we'll see how that plays out that is the game plan but it is going to be tricky so school starts soon um things are actually what uh, what is tricky is everyone taking online classes or like are the classes going live in person i mean it, they are. They are going to be live and in person. But, right, so a professor like me, I typically teach juniors and seniors only, and that's with good reason. Um, you know, it, it weeds out some of the other ones that might be kind of a pain in the ass. Um, so, the, but some of the seniors, I, I'm, you know, very much uh, involved with the students all the time, and I talk to them directly. So many of them say, look, I took a job in, in Tampa. I only have one semester left. I moved back to my parents' house in New York. What are you going to get, like a 4.5-month lease and move back down here? Like, I completely understand, you know, if you've only got one semester, it's a tough kind of ask to be like, all right, move back to Boca, wrap up your school. So there's going to be some people that inevitably have to remain virtual, and I'm ready for that. Sure, and rents are through the roof right now. So, of course, if they're trying to do four months, <laughs> six months, it's absolutely a pain. Well, let's get into our guest today. You know, we have Tony Zaccario here. He's the president of Stretch Zone, and we are excited to hear about 
how your franchise has evolved. Because Stretch was on our podcast, I think, you know, episode 15 or 20 back in the day when it was probably like 40, 50 stretch zones around the U.S., you know, or something like that. I don't even know. But, Tony, welcome to the Shrimp Tank. Thank you, Tell guys. Us Thank a you little guys for bit having about... me. And first and foremost, it's Kevin, that was the most eloquent spin on a textbook definition that I've probably ever heard. I um, see that a lot here in the Shrimp Tank. Yeah, but, but I appreciate it. I mean, it's, it sounded great. So, um, no, so, so what stretch zone is is um, – in essence, is practitioner assisted stretching, and so it is a franchise concept. And so the service that we provide is proprietary, using a, a patented stabilization system. Um, couple that with with a nationally recognized training program, uh, which is our stretch zone training program. Uh, we're we're essentially able to service a, a wide variety of individuals um, through stretching itself. And so it really is a health and wellness service. Um, the best way to compare it is it's essentially where clients come in, lay on a comfortable table, we do all the work, and you get all the benefits, and it is just that simple. Um, and, and so it's been a wild ride. I think when you talk to uh, the other individual at Stretch Zone back in, God, what year was that? 2018. We started the two, So 2018, we were probably roughly around 25 locations. And so, so today we sit at 130. Um, wow. Open uh, just opened up 1:30 uh, this week. Uh, have about 12 opening up within the next 30 days. Uh, looking to add on about um, close to 60 uh, by the end of the year. We have 40 slated and build out now, and so so we're in, the, we're in this mode of rapid expansion. And and quite frankly, it's looking for for good franchisees that share our core values and and just trying to make the biggest impact in communities across the country. And how many states are you in currently? Uh, we are currently in 26 states. Um, I know that that's going to change probably, I think, within the next few weeks. That'll probably be up to 29. You know, we have one going in Anchorage, Alaska. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> shockingly enough. Still waiting for the franchisee in Hawaii. Um, so if you're out there, give me a call because I'd love, love to make that trip out there. Um, we got Alaska, Missouri, so, so we're expanding pretty quickly. And walk us through the process, right? I'm a new client. I'm coming in, a new customer. Kind of walk through the front yeah. doors. How does memberships work? What's the ballpark pricing? And kind of what do I get each session, for example? For sure. And, and, and so the, the biggest thing I always try to relate to clients is, you know, at the base level, stretching is for everyone. Everyone understands that at the core level. Most people don't stretch because they either don't know how to do it um, or they're too lazy to do it. Case in point here. And so what the service that we do in the stabilization system and why it's proprietary and why it's patented makes such an impact um, is because it does act as an extra pair of hands. And so it allows people, whether you're an aspiring collegiate athlete, whether you're just trying to live your life better or easier, maybe play around a golf without feeling low back pain, you know, help out with some sciatic issues, low or, or whether sleeping through the night, you're able to do that and able to service that and make a difference. And so first and foremost, when a client comes in, it's about designing a program that's unique to them. And what I mean by that is you always want to ensure that you're addressing the needs and really the why of the client. And so everyone comes in for a different reason. And so when you're trying to establish that need, it's then designing a unique program for that client. So the first stretch is always free. And so we understand that, hey, listen, when I, when I tell you guys here, hey, we do all the work, you do all the benefits. I'm sure there's someone listening to this right now. I'm sure you guys are listening to this saying, um, you know, I don't believe that. And, and, and we get that, which is why we say across the country is the first stretch is on us. Come in. I got to believe like the, the first store that opened, you know, so many people heard of this idea and like, they probably thought that the founder was crazy, right? Like, like you're going to do what open up, you know, this thing called stretch zone and people are going to pay, you know, X amount yeah, you know, it, to, to come in there and do memberships. Right. It, it was wild. Um, and a lot of the early stages and talking about the business lifespan, a lot of it was educating the consumer. And th there's a tough piece to that. And still to this day, when we go into a new market, yes, there's brand awareness. Yes, there's incredible partnerships that we've been able to conjure up with Drew Brees and some franchisees in the local market. But, um, yeah, early on, it's everyone thought you, you were crazy to do stretching alone. And we were the pioneers in the industry. And, and, and the individual founded at Jordan – um, really took this to the masses in the first one to kind of create these retail spaces and these standalone spots to just do stretching. And so we found that the biggest impact was creating programs. And back to your original question, I mean, so it's always a membership-based model. So people come in once we design a program for them. The best thing about our services is that you will feel a difference, right, when you get off the table. This isn't one of those things where we're going to say, hey, listen, wait three months, four months, and you'll eventually feel something. 
um, you, you'll feel the difference and know whether or not this is for you by the time you get done with that first session. And then, you know, after the program, we design the program specific to you so we can go ahead and address those needs. Um, and, and then normally the clients either come back on maintenance or they, they re-up for other programs and, and continue to try to address whatever need they came in for to obviously keep going and, and, and really just improve their daily lives, which is the ultimate goal. You said the word free. So, Kevin, he's in static on the end of this day, but look at him. He loves his free rides. Right, well, Kevin? Yeah. It's Boca Raton. Come on. The <laughs> land of the free. Yeah. No, I was really excited to have this on the um, on the show because it's funny you mentioned, you know, everybody knows they should stretch. And I was kind of thinking, mm, really? Because I mm-hmm. went for probably a good, I don't know, 20 years. Aside from, like, um, you know, formal sports, which we'd always try to rush through the stretching. You right. know, the coach is like, yeah, hit some things. We're like, okay, let's get on the field, play some ball. And then, you know, past those kind of team and, and school-age sports, it was like, stretching you know no i go straight to the weights jump on the treadmill you know stayed active but it wasn't something that was really on my radar at all um but then you know you're a young guy you may not know yet but you get a little <laughs> bit older right once you pass that 30 threshold and like i was always pretty tight but it was like huh you know you really kind of feel and uh, so I got into to hot yoga and have realized a lot of the benefits of stretching. But um, this is a, this is different, right? Because it's assisted. So I want to ask you a little bit about like sure. what is the the advantages and the benefits of you know? Yeah, sure, you can stretch on your own. But um, what are what are some of those advantages of of having someone to help you? Yeah, I mean when you're when you have someone doing it for you. A, it's a more efficient way to stretch, and just quite frankly, it, there's a more systemic approach aside from the expertise that that person's bringing on board. Let's say you had the same expertise but you're trying to do on your own. Um, there's just certain stretches in certain muscle groups in certain places that you, you simply can't stretch on your own. Um, you know, the simplest comparison you can make is, you know, you doing a hamstring stretch. Is It's vastly different if you go down and you touch your toes and do whatever you might do versus, hey, someone helping you out and so a strapping system able to hold the other leg down while you lift the other one up to really get every single hamstring within that muscle group. Um, so w- w- combined with the strapping system and the extra individual, you have the extra set of hands in the strapping system. And, and what we try to do is you know, we work with the nervous system and we work with something called the stretch reflex. And so in, in essence, we always compare it to you know, a, a seatbelt. And, and what happens is your stretch reflex is there to essentially protect your body from injury. Um, meaning that, and, and the reason why I compare it to a seatbelt is let's say you're driving in the car and, you know, your, your favorite, you know, artist comes on. I'm not sure what it might be for, for y'all. Um, you know, I know you were saying you're a lovely Chris Stapleton fan over there before. I was messing with you. And oh, we got it on your hobby survey over there. Oh, it's on I there. It. It's I on there. Um, so anyway, so let's say your your favorite radio comes on you, and you and you you bend down real quick to turn up the turn up the volume. And what does your seatbelt do? It locks up. It's there to prevent you from injury from flying through the windshield or anything like that. However, it doesn't recognize that there's no emergency going on. You're simply just trying to turn up the volume on the radio. Same thing with your body and when you're trying to stretch is the stretch reflex is there to protect the body and protect the muscles from overextending or causing injury. So when you stretch yourself, you go down and touch your toes, that tightness you're feeling is the actual stretch reflex kicking in. And so we work on a number scale. So a three, five, seven, three being a light stretch, five a mile, seven is a deep stretch, even at seven, no discomfort. Now effectively, what we're doing is we're working with that stretch reflex. If I bring your leg up for a hamstring stretch and you go to a three, you feel a little bit of tightness, that stretch reflex is kicking in. We allow it to relax, and that person's going to hold the leg there, whatever it might be, until the body relaxes, which allows us to go further to a five. Stretch reflex kicks in, goes to seven. And, and so th- there is no discomfort in the process. So it's not any kind of, you know, we don't believe necessarily pushing back or any of that nature, PNF stretching, what you might hear, or might be familiar with. Um, but working with someone else allows you to get a deeper, more efficient stretch than what you could get on your own. Um, which is going to resolve a lot of these issues that a lot of people come in for quicker, um, more effectively. And who do you cater to mostly? Like what age bracket? Is it the 40 to, to 60 crowd? Is it female versus male? Yeah, so, so one of the interesting things and when, I was, when I was hearing Kevin go on about you know, how you relate to it as a consumer. Sure. And you know, I think everyone that comes on to Stretch Zone first is always like, listen, this is great for athletes. This would be great for, you know, FAUs, teams, or whatever it is. And yes, it is. And everyone understands that from the athletic standpoint or from the activity standpoint. What's surprising is our base is predominantly made up of 
45 and up. Male, female splits about 50 to 51 percent. So one, give or take one or two percentage points. Yeah, which is remarkable across the country. And, you know, so what you're finding is that, yes, stretching is very important for those that are active, but it's even more important for those who aren't. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, yep. uh, you know, what Kevin's talking about earlier as, as we hit our 30 mark, as we mm-hmm. hit our 40 mark, right, you're, you can't do as much with your body as you once could, and it feels great to get yep. a good stretch, right? And, so, and, and I think it's what, what value you put on, you know, when you're talking about activity is, yes, there's value to going out and playing a game of basketball, going out for a run, going and playing golf. What kind of value do you put on someone who just wants to be able to play with their grandkids or make it through the night and sleep a full night? without having any lower back pain. And these are the issues that you might see later on in life because the body's deconditioned. Um, and you have a lot of people that come in that have never stretched a day in their life. And, and you sit there and they get off the table and it's like, wow, I feel amazing. It's like, well, yeah, no kidding, because you're, you're actually doing something. You've stretched for the first time for 30 minutes straight. And, um, and so that's what's been surprising throughout this journey and, and seeing it first and foremost and firsthand is that yeah, it, it really is kind of that, that 45 and up that's, that seeks just as much benefits from the collegiate athletes, from the aspiring pro athletes. Um, and so it's, and it's funny because then you have a whole other sector of individuals where, you know, we have people with MS, Parkinson's, um, that, that, that truly have other medical conditions where stretching is super beneficial and they need help doing it. Um, and, and so we, we always joke about it in the office because, you know, you can walk into a store and there can be a pro athlete on the table you know, someone who's elderly, right, who might have one of these conditions, Parkinson's, you know, MS, whatever it might be, and on the same table as you have an aspiring collegiate athlete all in one store seeking the same exact benefit um, from the service. So tell us a little bit about the person actually doing the stretching. Mm-hmm. You know, do they have to go to, you know, Stretch Zone University, you get a degree, and now you're, you're ready, you know, yeah. to, to do the stretching? Like, how does that part work? The other side of that, I would assume, is like, you know, males would want – Females maybe to do the stretching on their behalf, or females will want females. I just relate it back to I haven't been there, but I know when I get like a massage, you right? Been there? I've not. I've not been there yet. So you interviewed. A, so we did this two years, three years ago, and you still haven't been. I tried actually. I could show you meetings that were uh, canceled. <laughs> hey, should I swing by? And well, you never, come in. Never, let me know when you want to go happened, to the store. Actually, and, and so take up those emails for you, so you can see. Um, no, I mean, the, the thing is, as far as the, the practitioners, what we call them, the one that are doing the actual stretching itself, um, you know, first and foremost, we always look for people with the appropriate backgrounds. So massage therapists, personal trainers, exercise physiology, um, uh, nursing students, people that might be in school for some of these degrees that have the appropriate physiology and anatomy background. Um, secondly, they go through our stretch zone training program, which is nationally recognized. And, you know, that is a comprehensive training so that they can effectively uh, apply our techniques and methodology um, right away when they when they get out into one of the locations and and so it's a it's a pretty robust training program comprehensive training program um, but we also understand that and from a from a quality perspective you know that's something that we're we're very strict and excuse me stringent about um, nationwide because it, it is our product it is our service that we provide and and when you're in a hands on service you, you you by no means can't have a fault in in quality control so to speak. Um, and, and so, so yeah, it's a pretty comprehensive training program. And, and, and to your point of, you know, hey, do you have females or males want to work with a female or male practitioner or vice versa, whatever it might be? Um, it, it's not so much the case. And I think part of it is it's an open concept. You know, we come in there, it's, it's typically high energy. And so it, it's really normally an empty shell, 1,000 to 1,200 square feet um, with five or six tables inside the location. Uh, we, we always compare it to it's, it's very much of a, a barbershop mentality, great relationships, a lot of conversation um, okay. rather than any private rooms, which is why I think people are more OK with, you know, it doesn't really matter who's doing the stretching. And one of the things we pride ourselves in and why we're so strict about the training is, you know, whether you get stretched here in Boca, Anchorage, Alaska, California, wherever it might be, by whoever it might be, you're going to get the same quality of service. And so it's not necessarily about the individual that's giving the, the, the okay. stretch. It's about the service itself. Um, which is why we've been able to scale at such a quick pace and obviously, um, you know, at such a big size. So let's let's go backwards for a moment. You know, tell us the early days, right? When you first are open up a couple of locations, it was not a franchise, I'm assuming, in the early no. days. So tell us how those first couple stores went. And then when you guys determined to make it into a franchise and the stress you went through during those stages, because I know it was not easy. Franchising is not a simple concept. Just say, hey, I'm going to franchise, right? Yeah. So go through some of those early days with it, us. You know, Stretch on first started, 
you know, in the whole timeline stretch on Star with with Jordan Gold, who's the founder, who really created the methodology, and 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 he started back in 1999, uh, believe it or not. And you know, I know we were having a conversation beforehand. I mean, he he dedicated his life to it, and you know, this is his baby. This is what he his whole life is. And um, when he first started, he was doing one off athletes, so sports athletes, uh, celebrities, one off clientele. And then he kind of had this moment because he originally created the methodology when working with his grandfather and the whole pop-up story, which you can find online on stretchdown.com. And, um, but it's more so after he worked with his grandfather, he really wanted to go ahead and, and bring it to the masses. And he kind of had this moment where, listen, I, I can't just do this with one-off clientele. I need to find a way to reach everyone's grandfather. And, um, so that's when the first storefront opened up, uh, back in 2015 down here in Fort Lauderdale. I oh, actually have Aventura first. Um, and the first storefront was truly just 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 testing a retail model where sh- everyone just came in for stretching. Um, during that time, there, there was some licensing. So first, we started doing some licensing, meaning that we would have a table inside of a gym, chiropractor, doctor's office. Um, and then after the first storefront model, you know, to begin with, we we obviously started corporate first, franchising. Uh, I'm not well, at least not for us. You know, we didn't come out of the gate saying, "Hey, we want to do franchising." Um, I think there's a few different levels of proof of concepts. And what I mean by that is the first proof of concept was the storefront model. The first proof of concept was the stretch itself, and that people actually wanted to invest in the stretch. The second proof of concept was the storefront model. Um, and so we had up to 10 to 12 corporate stores at one point. And during that time, we had a few little licensees. And um, the licensees ended up seeing what we were doing with the storefront models. They really liked it. Um, and so they converted their licensing over into okay. a true storefront. And then those licensees turned into the initial first franchisees. And that's when we kind of decided, hey, we're going to franchise. We went to the licensees and said, hey, this is what we've learned. And and when I first came on, I was creating a lot of processes and procedures. Um, And and so we went to these licensees and said, hey, listen, you can get X now for licensing. You get X plus plus with franchising, all the support that comes with franchising. And And as you guys know, it's... You know, franchising is very much so about the product or service that you're selling. But in my mind, franchising is more so about you're investing in the systems and processes and procedures and the support um, behind franchising. And so after that, you know, in the franchising world, I mean, God, there's stories for there, for, for days, uh, especially with COVID and, that, and everything that came about. Um, you know, you always start with your friends and family first. And so franchising, it's, it's whoever can invest in the brand, you know, every, anyone, any, any believer. And, you know, so we started doing friends and family, mom and pops. And, and what we found was we were always very mindful of controlled growth, believe it or not, as we sit here with, with 135 years later. Um, but we we're always mindful of controlled growth. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can grow to your death very quickly. There's, there's plenty of case studies constantly franchising, not franchising. But what we found is the, the original people we started franchising to, they wanted to grow their own systems, and they wanted to grow, and grow their own markets. And, you know, it's always a positive indicator in any franchising is multi-unit operation because not only are they showing that, hey, we're, we're not only finding success financially, but we're enjoying the experience, and we're enjoying the experience with the franchisor. Um, and then so we didn't, we didn't do our first trade show until, oh, man, uh, probably December of 2018, and so around there is our first ever trade show. And at the time, we already had 30 stores. And, and so that we had the proof of concept of the storefront model. And the reason why we were so iffy about going, you know, guns blazing on the, the franchising model uh, was it's a whole different proof of concept. And it's a whole different model because and I think the mistake in, in a lot of franchising concepts, and hopefully this is in your workbook slash textbook, is, um, you know, a lot of the franchising concepts is just because I can do it, doesn't mean that I can effectively teach or train someone else to do as just a good of a job. You got that quote, Kevin, for the and next workbook? <laughs> Put it right in there. Oh, yeah, that's in there, right? So that's one of the things we've talked about a lot on the show is, you know, uh, franchising certainly has a ton of advantages, which, which you've been able to capitalize on, which is that rapid growth is one of mm-hmm. the big ones, right? But quality control is one that can easily get out of control as you kind of scale up depending on the model how replicable it is what right. kind of standards what processes you have for um you know checking into potential franchisees and training and all those kind of stuff you see so many times yeah you can expand rapidly but it may not be representative of the brand and you can have all sorts of repercussions if you 
if you don't have for sure. that really buttoned up. For sure. And I, and I, you know, one of the most humbling stats and, and listen, growth is important. Um, you know, I'm obviously, I'm younger and this is my first round of franchising, but you kind of get a feel for the industry pretty quick and it's a pretty tight knit industry. And, uh, I definitely think there's a, a right way of franchising. There's a wrong way of franchising. And in, in my mind, franchising boils down, boils down to this. You're successful when they're successful period as a franchise order franchisee. Um, and you know, so when I say that growth is always good, what I'm most humbled by is system performance, um, not having a single store failure, uh, to date at all, even through COVID and all that. And I think part of that is a testament because early on we focused on the unit level economics of the business. We were honed in on that. And, and now it's been more so the glitz, the glam, uh, making sure we have the proper pillars in place to, to obviously get the brand name out there. But yeah, to your point, it's, you know, the proof of concept in franchising is you have to be able to prove that you can create a turnkey process that someone else can take and it's dumbed down enough to where they can go ahead and, and replicate that wherever in the country. Um, and, and so it, it was it was quite the journey. And so started franchising truly in about three years ago, I'd say. When I say truly franchising, meaning like open the floodgates. And uh, here we are today at one thirty. And I think the biggest thing, another piece to franchising is you got to make sure you bring on the right people. Sure. And the, the franchisees are so, so important. And, um, you know, I always say we're, we're fortunate and blessed to be in a position where we do say no to franchisees um, sometimes because we feel that they aren't a good of course. foot you fit. Your whole brand overnight, one, one yeah. bedroom. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the running joke in franchising is that maybe some of the people and those friends and family that you picked early on maybe probably wouldn't be <laughs> approved, approved now. So, yeah, it's, it's been, a, been a wild ride. We had delivery dudes on, and, and that was the case. Yeah. And he's still battling to get, you know, just that one out from delivery dudes, uh, which I think they recently might have done that, actually, because it's <laughs> a notification that they, uh, they merged with another brand. Uh, but anyway, we're going to take a quick commercial break to hear from one of our sponsors when we get back. We're going to jump into our Hot or Not segment of the show. Step into our state-of-the-art innovation lab and create your digital future. Oz uses cutting edge technology and 22 years of industry knowledge to enhance customer experience through digital innovation in a variety of expertise. Oz is a leading global consulting company whose services and solutions are trusted by startup, midsize, and even Fortune 500 companies. Get to know more about Oz's Salus, a mobile solution bringing us back to max capacity, and their latest solution, Rainmaker, saving insurance companies years of work. To learn more about Oz and their exciting technologies, visit followoz.com. That's F O L L O W O Z.com. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Oz Digital Studio. And as a reminder, you catch all these amazing episodes up on iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you catch your podcast today. Of course, our website, shrimptankpodcast.com. You can check out Tony's bio up there. And of course, reach out to him on LinkedIn, social media. He's everywhere. So, Tony, on this segment of the show, it's called Hot or Not. I'm going to ask you a question and dive into why you believe, you know, the question we're asking is hot or not. So, let's start when it comes to financing, right? Lots of times I see franchises set up, you know, their own private financing. So, that way, when you get, you know, someone new, you know, that wants to open up, they don't have to go through all, you know, the bells and whistles through SBA loans or, or banks. And it, it you know shortens the process, of course, but not all franchises do it. So, and I don't know if you do it or not. So is it hot or not to set up your own fran- you know, um, I, I part, for, for us in particular, I would say not. Okay. Um, you know, we, we always have been focused on keeping it as low capital and the lowest sure. barrier of entry and for franchisees. And again, this goes back to, in my mind, building a franchise system for the long term. You know, our, our initial contribution is is legitimately uh, 106 to max 199 um, to, for total startup costs. It includes franchise fee, initial training, initial marketing run. I mean, soup to nuts. And so with that, it doesn't necessarily behoove us to get into the nitty-gritty of, of financing. Um, I, I do know some concepts that do, but but also the the – the SBA in a lot of times, and there's so many brokers, and obviously you know this, but, of course. but there's so many different brokers and third parties that can make it seamless and make it very easy for the franchisor. Um, you know, the franchisees, their experience sometimes, yeah, I know if I hear obviously from the franchisee all the time that maybe we're trying to grow their own unit, sometimes it's seamless, sometimes it's, it's, it's arduous and they ask for the same thing a million times over. 
Um, but it hasn't been a pain point for us whatsoever to where we would even need to consider it to bring it in-house. And so that is why I would say not. Yeah, I agree. A lot of lenders today, you know, have figured it out. Very smooth, online, yeah. you know, Lendio, uh, Guidant Financial. All these are SBA lenders that just go right on their site like Kayak, right? It's like p- booking a flight. They figured out the process that's seamless. And then there's others like the traditional banks where they are just a pain in the bud. It's just like committee after for committee sure. after committee. And it takes six months to get loans approved. And I also think the size alone, obviously. So it's like a normal 7A where we're requesting maybe 150. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty seamless. And, and, and even the SBA will fly through that for the most part. If, and typically where we see it in the threshold is normally around that 300 mark. If we have someone requesting over that, it becomes more of a pain. Um, but, but franchisees, it's, it's really not an issue for us. So do you refer people to a specific bank or do you just let them do it? You say, um, go, let them do it for the now. most part. Gotcha. Um, because it, it really is up to them. Sometimes, you know, everyone, everyone always knows a guy. Of course. And, and everything. And yeah. <laughs> so. well, everyone's getting email after email regarding loans. <laughs> exactly. Got a voicemail today saying, congratulations, you're approved for 350000 Call me back. We'll get this done. I'm like, who is this? Yeah. I'm like, what? like, how do they even have my cell phone? Uh, it was a good pitch, actually. I almost did it. I almost calling back. <laughs> you sure it wasn't Kevin? It might have been Kevin. I mean, Kevin wants the, All the, the money, but there was no loan backing it, of course. Yeah. Just write a check, Kevin Cox. That's funny. Yeah, so you talk about multi-unit um, owners, and, and sometimes some of the people that I talk to that have misconceptions about franchises um, uh, want to kind of buy a franchise of some sort and then just, you know, just collect all the funding, right? So yeah. it's sort of absentee, non-manager franchisees. Is that hot? Or I'm going to guess probably not. It's very not, and... You know, we aren't, there are a lot of concepts out there that require you to be an owner operator. I yeah. mean, they, they actually require you. And in those regards, you, you're, you're buying a job. And we don't do that step. I mean, we, we do cater more towards what I would call a semi absentee model. You need to be actively involved. And, and one of the things with franchisees is, and you get it more robust. I mean, normally it gets filtered out now as, as the brand evolves and it gets, you know, more comprehensive and robust. You don't get the people, but initially you always get people that are like, you know, I, I I thought I'd just go ahead and dump my money and get an eight eight per, percent return. Um, and you know, it's conversation. passive. It's passive, right? You yeah, it's passive, it and it's like, well, so well no. says about real estate, right? Well, like, <laughs> no, not until you get a bad uh, tenant there. Yeah, it's I mean, not if, quite passive. If you're, uh, what, the, not everybody looks at it this way, even on the academic research side. But yeah, I mean, people need to understand that that you know, if you want to be a franchisee, at the end of the day, from my perspective. Uh, you're still an entrepreneur. You, you you really are. Some people try to say, yeah, it's like buying a job. But it's like, no, it's buying the processes, the right. business model. Uh, you know, we talk about the entrepreneurship boot camp and some of the stuff mm-hmm. I teach. These are people trying to figure out a business model, and a ton of them fail because it's really, really hard right. to have a complete, comprehensive, and validated right business model. So that's what you're doing. So you're really just mitigating some of the risk. But at the end of the day, you're still an owner, right? And the buck's got to stop somewhere. There's going to be emergencies. There's going to be well, there's like, people. It's all the same thing. I you mean, know? you have yeah. people involved. And, and I think it's, it's always an operational investment. And that's what we tell people all the time. And no matter how, you know, it's, it's such a catch-22 because as a franchise or you always want to pitch how seamless how easy how you know it's going to be for you as the franchisee and this is why we're better and this is why but you got to be actively involved and you got to focus on it and um it's funny because the only and i agree with you 100 percent. and and the only counter to you know some of the things that you're saying is i have this discussion with our fac we have a franchise advisory council that, that we stay in close contact with we're always going back and forth on and um you know, franchising has entre- entrepreneurial aspects to it, but I would argue more on the fence of a franchisee is not a true entrepreneur because they're not creating. And in fact, there's sometimes where we turn away from certain prospective franchisees because they are too entrepreneurial and they want to reinvent a wheel that's already been invented. And that's a huge red flag when you're talking about looking at prospective franchisees. Because if you see that there is an effective business model, it's proven, it's validated. I never want to stifle the creativity of a franchisee. If you have a great idea, communicate it. But someone who comes in there in that initial discovery day and says, yeah, yeah, I know what you're doing, but here's what you could do to make it better without experiencing it. 
if a franchise or that's I mean that's red flag number one. Yeah, of absolutely, course. and that's we see. So yeah, I, I definitely there are some nuances and some right. differences, but you know, um, it, it's funny you mention that. I run our Veterans Florida Entrepreneurship Program, and we've had a lot of success with that group in uh, the franchisee space mm -hmm. because they um, they need a playbook, right? right? They need a field guide, but boy, can they execute efficiently. Yeah. I mean, they go out there, they attack, they get it done, they come back, what's next? And and that's seemingly a really good fit for the, uh, the veteran groups. For sure, I agree. Uh, hot or not, when it comes to partnering with influencers, celebrities, professional athletes, right? It always sounds really good, but... It, they could be a pain in the ass. Let's 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 tell the truth, right? So hot or not from experience. Of course, some could be hot, some could be not that you have partnered with in the past. I'm gonna have to say hot, Drew. I love you. Um, and so obviously for our brand, you know, we, we has had this partnership with Drew Brees, and um, I'll say hot if it's the right individual. And and what I mean by that is. You know, we as a brand, when, when Jordan and I first started creating this thing, it's um, we weren't dead set on like, hey, we need to go find uh, an endorsement. We need to find an ambassador. And, and you know, the whole Drew thing is it was serendipitous in, in how it came about. And, and the reason why, you know, Drew and the partnership works out, A, he believes in the service. He believes in it so much to invest in, and open up his own franchises himself. And, um and most importantly, you know, he's a stand-up guy. He, he shares the same character and core values that we have as a company and as an organization, and, and that's what speaks volumes. And so, so I would say hot if it's, if it's the right individual because on the same token, ambassadorship and influencers can also damage your brand. And, and if you're not careful about who that person is, and, and it's so funny seeing, and the other reason why I'd say hot is seeing the market shift to these regional influencer concepts. And, and, you know, obviously with social media, um, you know, there are people with serious followings that do reach a very targeted market, um, that can be very beneficial for, for the regional aspect of franchisees. Um, so, so that's, that's my take. So, but I'd, I'd definitely say hot. Can All you right. kind of explain a little bit more though? Like, how did you land Drew Brees, and what what kind of what's he doing for the brand? You know, does he own different locations? Yes, yeah, so, uh, so go a little bit further. So, um, so Drew came about is actually a, a one of his college roommates, and you know, it's a pretty cool story where where him and some 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 of his former roommates and and also people that played with him over in um, Purdue. Um, one of his friends was interested in franchising. He first found us, and he called in just like a normal franchise prospect. And um, he let it on pretty late in the fact that, you know, hey, listen, you know, he knows Drew and obviously whatever, but he was more interested in the brand. And, and Drew initially kind of found us in the sense of he had tried the product service, fell in love with it, and he was actually just going to sit in on the discovery day um, to help out his friend. Oh, and cool. yeah, and to say, like, hey, to give his insight. Because the one thing I'll say a lot of people don't know about Drew is, you know, obviously he's an incredible individual, uh, incredible athlete. Um, he has an, an incredible business acumen, and he is sharp. And, and that is the one thing I'll take away from the meeting. And, you know, we always joke in franchising or any business, you, you can tell how much someone knows by the questions they ask. And um, he, he's just a sharp guy. And, and so he was sitting there to help out, and he has some franchising experience, which at the time I didn't even know. He has actually a pretty pretty comprehensive uh, franchising background and from a franchise or franchisee level. And so he was sitting in, and he kind of fell in love with the story, as many of us do. He fell in love with the, the, the service. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, you know, he decided that he wanted to come on board and, and really partner with his college roommates to open up locations. And, you know, they've, they've already opened up two in Louisiana. Oh, cool. um, they've opened up, you know, they're opening up. They had one open in Indianapolis, opened up two more in the next 30 days, and the third one in, in New Orleans shortly thereafter. And, and so, it, and I think that speaks volumes to especially franchise prospects and franchisees because you know, listen, if he's willing to invest into opening stores, then then, then why shouldn't they? And and um, so on top of that, you know, he came on board as as an ambassador to help out with some some national ambassadorship. But um, no, it, it's been an incredible experience, great great relationship, great human being um, all around, and and so we're, we're really excited to see how that tra transpires and how that progresses. What's the hottest region right now? You mentioned all these new stores opening up. Where Where is uh, the hot spot, if there is one? I'll mix up the question a bit. 
Um, you know, it's we don't target growth per se as a concept, meaning that there's a lot of concepts out there that say, hey, listen, we're short in West Coast, Northeast, Northwest. We're going to go ahead and do a lot of targeted marketing that way. Um, most of our franchisees come from existing clients. And, you know, we do have a lot of, you know, individuals that might come in with disposable income. They try the service, say, this is great. This is a very simple business model. There's not a lot of moving parts, no pun intended, uh, but no moving inventory, no waste, no spoilage, nothing like that. Um, and so it's kind of random. And so what will happen is we'll put a store. So the first time a store goes out into a new market, all of a sudden the franchise lead requests and prospects and go through the roof in that initial market. And because they've never heard of the brand, even you know, obviously you know, at one thirty, which is relatively small, and so that I would say, I, I would say, oh man, it's just funny because it ebbs and flows. Texas is big, Denver's big, um, you know. Then then it turns into one of these games where you might have one or two franchisees there, and the second someone else starts coming in there and start playing some stores, then there's this fear of loss, and it's like, well, hold on a second, I, I need yeah. to. Um, the Northeast, I would say, actually overall, and we're, we're really because we have such a strong footprint in the Southeast. Because obviously we, we've grown out of Fort Lauderdale, um, the Northeast is picking up like crazy. And, and I think a lot of that is because now the restrictions are kind of loosening up a little bit. People are getting out. We just opened up the first store in Long Island uh, recently, and so the first one in New York. And so we're in Long Island, uh, Manhasset. Oh, cool! I was from Port Washington, right next door. Oh, really? You went where the money is. Smart, and so. Smart. <laughs> yeah, so the fran- franchisees, it's, it's like one of the wealthiest towns in Long Island for everyone listening. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fund managers live there. It's very wealthy. It, it, it's a great market, and um, he's crushing it as you can imagine. And so, so he he's going to be growing up stores rapidly there. Um, New Hampshire is a place. Boston, first one's going in Boston, and and so it's kind of funny because there's there's these random spots that we're not in yet, and and Boston was one of them. Boston's a huge market. Okay, last question before Shoot. we head to a commercial break. Uh, we didn't talk much about marketing, so what's your hottest way to market these franchises, and, and what's not the hottest, what you've learned from all your experience, right? It's Everyone loves social media, but you're going after a specific demographic to get them into your doors, right? you you got to be able to afford this stuff. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, from, from the store level, it's Facebook and Instagram. Uh, okay. I mean, they, they knock it out. I mean, Facebook, as far as targeting, it's just... It's kind of it's creepy yeah, it in my mind. Crazy. Yeah, that's why I'm not on there. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, believe it, I don't have Facebook either. So do you allow your local smart. franchises to have local URLs like you know? No, so it's interesting. Stretch so, zone Boca, Stretch Zone, you know, so Kansas the, City, for example. So the most efficient way is every is a little inside secret, but you know, every franchisee has their own landing page, and so we are also co-owners on the Facebook page. Gotcha. Now we allow, which is different. We try to customize the landing pages so that the franchisee can say, "Hey, listen, you're the GM. I'm going to have your photo on it. Here's a picture of the store. Here's whatever it might be." So from the consumer side, if I'm scrolling through Facebook, I see Drew Brees' face. Say, "Hey, try for stretch free. Good. Click on it. It's going to direct me to the landing page to the local site, the nearest location. Okay. And it's going to look like its own URL, but in reality, it's still a landing page under our corporate, under our normal website." And what's not hot, right? You've tried stuff, you realize it does not work. Mailers or ads in the newspaper. I mean, you guys have tried everything and you figured out that ads are the best way. But, you know, tell our audience what you've learned from your mistakes. Um, not hot in general. I think in industry is is true TV. Like, uh, not true TV, the actual channel. But I'm saying, like, I, like, like, yeah. Yeah. I know, like, that, the actual TV commercials and, you know, always related to it is most people are either watching streaming services. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what are TV commercials, actually? No. I mean, I mean, honestly, and so it's like we have what's proven really effective is like OTT and CTV, and OTT is more so, hey, those bumper ads that you see on YouTube, um, streaming services, Hulu, YouTube TV, uh, Netflix, whatever it might be. But actual live TV, people either DVR it, so they fast-forward through every single commercial, or they're walking up to get away from the commercial. And so you still have these big brands that are more the dinosaurs that are, it's mind-blowing. They dump so much money behind these the TV commercials and the market you're reaching is, I'm, I'm not quite sure who. Um, and no analytics. No analytics. And, and that's the other frustrating part. And um, so, so I would say that's the one not as the industry as a whole. Um, but, but for us, mailers, mailers are actually good, so, shockingly. Any guerrilla marketing on you guys end? Like, just I mean, if you know the crowd, it's kind of like who who needs stretching. I mean, you could from brand camp, of, camp out at hospitals, putting things at uh, in their door handles, right? Like old school. Uh, no, guerrilla is big pre COVID. 
And so we always had doing events, not not necessarily hospitals, uh, and dropping them into. Kevin's the bags. Laughing, he's not as old school as me. And, you know, back and so, in the day, you needed a sale. You you thought you had to go get to beat the pavement. You thought you figured everything under the sun what you could do. I mean, we used to have. I'll tell you, when we first started, and this this is how archaic we were to begin with. We didn't have a website. We didn't have we didn't have anything. I mean, we didn't have a website. We were relying on Groupon and mailers, and that was it. And so there was a lot of guerrilla marketing to where you took a table, a foldable table to a golf, a golf tournament, a 5K, whatever it was. And the nice thing for us, it does work well because I can get you on the table, do a few stretches, you find out that you love it, and then you're, you're sold. Then word of mouth spreads out after that. So that is how you know the original Stretch Zone we got introduced to because we ran the Festival of Fitness. Oh, very cool. And we did this whole fitness event outside at the Booker Tone Innovation Campus. About 200 people came out. It was our first year doing the shrimp tank. We did our shrimp tank live, and it was all cool fitness professionals from down here in South Florida. And there was Stretch Zone, Very stretching cool. people out right in, right in the open. Um, I didn't get my chance to do it because I was running around, you know, obviously operating the whole entire thing. So I got to come to a store and, and give it a test this time around. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break to hear from one of our sponsors. When we get back, we're going to jump to our future focus segment. Are you having a hard time finding good people? The key to successfully finding top quality candidates is to expand your candidate pool. That's exactly what a virtual hiring event powered by Premier Virtual will do for you. Over 2,500 virtual hiring events later, more than 25,000 companies have connected with over 250,000 job seekers. These events are much more than a resume. Virtual hiring events give your recruiters the ability to meet and pre-screen candidates and decide if they're a good fit. The efficiency and effectiveness of virtual hiring events has reduced time to hire from an average of 30 days to just over 7 days. Premier Virtual has received a top rating for ease of use and customer support on software review sites like G2 and Capterra. We've also been selected a top 100 company to work for in Florida by Florida Trend Magazine. Meet our veteran-owned Delray Beach-based company by visiting premiervirtual.com and schedule a free demo to see how you could host your first virtual hiring event within 24 hours. PremierVirtual.com. It's time to take your hiring virtual. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank. So, Tony, on this segment of the show, it's our newest segment. Yep. It's called Future Focus because if you're interviewing 100-plus you know, entrepreneurs, CEOs, presidents, anything, you know, we've just realized everyone has the same struggle, figuring out how to hire the best people. So let's jump right into it. What is your guy's trick, you know, to staffing all your locations? Yeah, and hiring is a challenge right now. Um, across the industry, you know, I sit on ADP's Franchise Advisory Board, and, and you get people from all different kinds of industries and, and different perspectives, and that's the one um, common theme is that hiring is difficult. Uh, I would say for us, one, one of the pluses is that since we are the certifying body, uh, we don't need people that have necessarily the, 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 a certain certification to come on board is it makes hiring much easier for us because we are going to certify the individual. And so the funnel and the top of the funnel is much larger. Um, you know, for us, it's, it's you do the normal services. We use CareerPlug, which is a great hiring software. It's a third-party platform. because ZipRecruiter Indeed. That helps. And then but what we relate to franchising is if there's a good candidate out there, you either need to move quick. And also, it doesn't hurt back to beating up the pavement as far as guerrilla marketing with leads. You almost need to do the same for hiring. And it's, it's asking friends, it's asking, and the best way for us is always, you know, our, our staff are typically small, you know, max around 10 people um, per, lo- per location. And, and so a lot of times it's franchisees asking, you know, maybe one of their stellar employees, hey, do you know someone else that might be interested in, in a role? Um, and I think the other th- important piece from, from a corporate side and franchisor side, it's, it's understanding the shift in, in, in what the employees are looking for uh, this day and age, and and we talk about it all the time is the importance of culture in the organization and creating the proper culture in the organization. And you know, in my mind, people are so much more consumed with the experience of working rather than the financial implications of working, um, which are two vastly different things. So, what about on the corporate side? Is there any variance there? Because as you you know rapidly mm-hmm. grow from one thirty to two hundred, that's a lot of units to service. So I'm imagining you've got to do some hiring internally as well. It, it is. We're, we're we're constantly hiring on board, and a lot of it's through the efficiencies of operation. Right, cross training is important, but just from strictly the hiring side, 
it's a constant battle, and it's it's one of those things. If you want to stay ahead of the curve, you, you can't stop interviewing. And I think the biggest mistake that we see, not only that we've learned from the past, and also that we see franchisees make the same mistake, is that once they're settled with what they're they would like to have, or maybe they're overstaffed slightly, which is what they prefer, they stop the interview process, they stop looking for candidates, and everything grinds to a halt. And then all of a sudden, you get to this point where it's like, uh oh, I need two more people. And you're already four weeks behind the ball and and and, and behind the curve. And um, from the corporate side, it's more so we're in the we're in the position of, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time on creating the proper culture and is a priority within the organization to where we're looking for good talent. Um, and when we're growing so quickly, if there is a good talented individual out there that shares, you know, has proper character and core values and all the things that we look for, and we think they're going to be a great fit with the team, we're going to bring them on. And there's going to be a place for them, whether it's on the support side, whether it's on the training, whether it's on the store opening side. I mean, there's so many different avenues when you're growing. And if anything, my, my sentiment's always, I'd rather be overstaffed as a franchisor so that way we can provide the best support for franchisees. Because um, if you are behind the curve, I, I, I can assure you franchisees will be the first ones to let you know um, as a franchisor. Of course. Um, so so they paying a lot. Of, they want great service. They want, yeah. So what about virtual hiring? Have you tried that yet? Um, with, with regards to like just, just yeah, I, our sponsor Premier Virtual. I mean, their their brand just took off in the last twelve months, right? They they work with FAU, they work with the United States Army, and people are loving these virtual platforms where you know there's a stretch zone and mm-hmm. there's thirty other companies, but I can just peep into your room, and right there on the spot, you know, I might be a fit for you. So we kind of avoid all the back and forth, uh, setting up an interview. Actually, you know. we, we haven't, so I, I'd love to know more about that, honestly. They do a lot with franchises, so it, it could be a, a good synergy. Nice. I'll introduce you afterwards, of Thank course. You. So tell us some of the red flags, what you've learned, right? You've hired so many people over the years, and now you know like what to avoid during interviews where you don't have to second-guess yourself, like not hiring that type of person, you know, and... You know, on both sides, I guess, you know, opening up a franchise or just yeah, you know, I think, people I think on the corporate f- level. I think from interviewing, it's the, the way, you know, hiring so important, and I believe h- hiring slow is, yeah. is, is, is always what you want to do. And what I mean by that is you have to be super disciplined in your hiring processes, and you can't expedite a process either. And I think there's a, a lot of people, they make, you know, people that have high turnover and franchisees that necessarily might have a high turnover issue. It's not a systemic issue. It's normally, first question, person, the first thing I'm going to ask is who's doing the hiring? Do they have any interview experience? Have they ever done interviews before? Um, are you hiring from a point of desperation? Are you setting false pretenses? And so meaning, are you trying to oversell the job rather than actual vet the individual? Um, and so I think, I think certain red flags are, are people that haven't done any research and, and the biggest red flag is people that haven't done research oh, and it's the worst, right? They show up your office and you're like, you're like, have you vis- visited my website? Like, oh yeah, I'm meaning to do that. And you're like, you're here on an interview. You haven't looked at the well, website. So, so what like, we, so I've seen that. So what we, ad- so what we advise in just the simplest way is if I see an applicant come in and, you know, we go ahead and call and let's say Steffi comes into the thing and says, you know, I see your application as we always advise, listen, call them out of the blue. There's three basic questions you want to ask them. First one is, what got you interested in Stretch Zone? And the reason why we do that instead of setting up, hey, let's set up a phone interview. And the problem is you're going to go online, you're going to do your research instead of job hunting. If I'm calling Steffi out of the blue, she's going to answer their phone. She's going to say, can you remind me what Stretch Zone is? And it's like, okay, this is, this doesn't even yeah, need to go any further. applying 100 places, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And so those are the biggest red flags. And you know, normal things, you just want people that are passionate about the, the, the organization and, and, and what you're doing. And you know, just, you know, always the person that has the – the slew of issues with former employers is sometimes oh, the common complainer. Yeah, sometimes the common denominator happens to be them. Um, yes, but you can't tell them that. Or what about the ones that ask for directions to your office and you're like, really? Yeah, really? You didn't try Google Maps, right? Yeah, what year is this? There can be some students like that as really? well. You know, they just they they. It's not them. It's, oh, it's never them. them. This professor doesn't like them, but the, neither did the last one or the <laughs> one before. Or ah, it looks like you kind of had an issue with a whole line of yeah. professors. You That's know? odd, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you're listening, the easiest thing to do, you know, send the person, you know, a thank you card, an email. I mean, it's not rocket science today. So often, yeah, you know, no one does those little touches right after the. I interview. think that's huge. It is, and you know, like at a hundred people that you know that I you guys it's interviews, huge. it's probably like one percent. One for every hundred, actually, like send a card or, or an email, right? For sure. So, well, we're going to take a quick commercial break here from one of our sponsors. When we get back, we're going to jump to our Plead the Fifth segment of the show. 
Are you ready to make your indelible impression? Duray & Company is an award-winning, full-service, public relations and marketing agency with offices in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Aspen, Colorado. With practice areas in business, real estate, cannabis, nonprofit, legal, and lifestyle, Duray & Company is fully equipped to help clients reach their goals with strategies that are on point. Whether it's public relations, social media, digital marketing, content development, or other services, Duray & Company delivers results for business owners that address their business goals and reach their targeted audience. To learn more about Duray & Company and our services, visit durayandcompany.com, D-U-R-E-E-A-N-D-C-O-M-P-A-N-Y.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Shrimp Tank headquarters down here at FAU at the Adams Center. So, Tony, on this segment of the show, it is called Plead the Fifth. So when we jump into a question, you know, you got to try to answer the question. Or if you don't want to, of course, say plead the fifth, but you can only do it one time. And now there's a new rule. If you say plead the fifth twice, you got to pay my co-host Kevin Cox, you know, $200 with the Stretch Zone coupons. Okay? I made that up, Deal. of course, but we're going with it. Okay? Does that rule apply to every guest? Of course. Of course. Well, everyone can get Stretch Zone coupons if you're giving them. Okay. So, you know, let's... Go back to PR. We just heard uh, DeRay and company. Uh, what's been your biggest PR nightmare that you guys have run through? Knock on wood. Um, very much so. We have we have skirted uh, any kind of big nightmare and or any kind of really failing. And, and my biggest fear during it was, um, you know, during COVID. And, and, and not because there, there's something malicious that we were doing. It's, you know, health and wellness and, and obviously the, the health of the clients is always a priority and, and it's so funny because in a hands-on service we're doing the same protocols with with or without covid and of you know the the biggest fear i think for any brand when covid first happened and it's funny in our office we have a we have a newspaper from i think it was march 10th around that time 2009 or 2020 and you read through the the newspaper and it says you know, social distancing might last till August. And that was the big thing at the time. And then obviously knowing, I mean, everything happened so quick. And so I think the biggest fear of it ever occurring was one of those things to where you get wrongly accused of, hey, COVID came from, from one of your locations. And I think we all remember when COVID first happened, that's what, we're ha that was, that's what was happening in communities to where these bigger brands, to where people were literally calling out brands of where a COVID case happened. I mean, this is long before the shutdown, and it obviously got to the scale that it did and had the negative impact and um, the terrible impact it did in communities. But it, it was definitely – that was probably the scariest time. But, no, we, we've, we've skirted any kind of major any, – any PR issues. And what, what are some of the benefits Hopefully you, Shrimp you Tank is the first. seen from uh, having a PR company? Like a lot of businesses think, should I get one? Should I not? You know, I can do my own ads on Facebook. Do I need a PR company? And what are the benefits you've seen from PR? Yeah, I, I think PR and, and RBB, who we use, is is nothing but phenomenal and fantastic. And, and they're in the studio today, right? They, they are. And um, I, I think they, they provide a lot of benefit, and especially for brand awareness. Okay. And, and even at the localized level for franchising, it's – you know, they do a lot of the hard work and the lead work and the leg work to, to get opportunities for the brand that you maybe wouldn't have gotten. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, the one thing I love about RBB in particular, and, and they, they take as much pride in the brand as, as we do. And, nice. it, and it's hard to find that. And so I think from anyone who's considering PR, getting a PR agency, especially um, franchise or any kind of, you know, brand that's growing, if you're trying to increase brand awareness, which is the struggle for any kind of national brand, or growing brand, you, you definitely need PR, and, and you need the right people um, next to you, and not necessarily just any PR agency. So, Well, we're going to try to make a PR nightmare the next 10 minutes of this show, of course, because we got $200 on the line, and I want, I want Kevin to get $200 over at Stretch Zone, and I want your PR company so, to go back to the office to get some work done. I think they're sweating. I'll start with a pretty easy one. So what's the most uh, ridiculous complaint or request you've gotten from a franchisee? Um, you know, from, from the franchisees, it's, I always say this, and, and I really try to put in the perspective of nothing is, can be deemed ridiculous. And, and like the most ridiculous thing that happens is normally it's just, it's just perspective on priorities. And 
you know, I, it's, I've had countless times where franchisees will call up in the store opening process and they'll say, you know, hey, where can I get my shirts from or my business cards? And we'll tell them, we'll say, um, you don't have a lease. And so it's like, maybe you should worry about finding a, a location first before you worry about business cards. And and so I think it's, but you also can't deem it. And the one thing I work with our team in the culture stretch zone is like, we don't, nothing's ridiculous because for some of these people, it's their first time opening a business. And it's it just like with you guys, this might be, and if you had someone in here that was doing, that was running a podcast for the first time, it's to you guys, you've done this hundreds of times. Yeah. For them, it's their first. And you always have to be mindful of that. And when you're running a business, and, and, and COVID, again, was a, a, a big time to where you have to remember, regardless of your business acumen, your business experience, it, it was it was a scary time. I mean, because yeah. nobody knew that. And still is. We have major shutdowns happening right around the corner. For sure. And, and, and it's obviously still having a, you know, a, a harsh impact on communities. And um, so I, I would say that there's obviously the, the minutia where people say something where it's like, hey, you know, the level of importance to your business, is that really going to move the needle? Is that really going to make an impact? Um, and the other challenging thing is, again, the franchisee has to run their business. You know, there is a fine line between a franchisor providing support and a franchisor blurring that line of employer, which we're not. And, you know, I, I can't tell a franchisee who to hire, who to fire, how to pay them. I, I can't. I legally cannot. And so a lot of times you have franchisees that, you know, they're just trying to get information. And they don't understand that because they they're not franchising. They're, they're trying to run a business. Um, so, so nothing. So that's probably the most ridiculous stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Once again, you know, I'm very familiar with that strategy. Working with undercapitalized mm-hmm. students, T-shirts and business cards are a top priority <laughs> every single time they come through the entrepreneurship class. You know, you it's always a swag items. Going. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, always a swag hats. items. Yep. So funny. Okay, what's the the most inappropriate thing someone's done in a stretch zone? They come in. And they're playing around with you guys, and they've done something inappropriate. Um, yeah, I'll say we, you know, we have we have a, a zero. When I say zero tolerance policy when it comes to any any kind of sexual harassment, quid quid pro quo, anything like that. You know, we we take it very seriously because um, again, yes, the the health and wellness and the safety of our clients is the utmost important, but also that of the staff members and the team members that are, that are servicing. And you know, honestly, we, we have very minimal. I could count on one hand that the issues that we've had because it is an open concept because it's lights on everyone's clothed. It's not like massage industry where you have that, that major concern. That's actually why Jason never ended up visiting because he was like, "Well, I don't really want to go because oh, I, here I he don't goes. want to take here off he all goes. my clothes." Well, and thinking I was of like, it, Jason, I don't think that's the type of place it is. You well, know? Well, well, my story involved a guy named Jason, so there could be some synergies here. <laughs> so, but no, the, the worst, the worst thing that ever. Um, you know, it's just more of a kind of creepy moment where, you know, we've, we've had a, a individual, you know, request, you know, gift a practitioner with like a dress and something of that nature where it's just, it's inappropriate, it's uncomfortable. And, um, it's just, it, it's not going to be tolerated or allowed inside of our, our locations. What about on a, a customer, you know, and where they've done a, something inappropriate, you know, uh, they're messing around. They're farting in front of everyone. Like something like silly that they're just trying to get a joke on social media, like a TikTok video, anything like that. <sighs> we got so many jokesters today. I'm not on TikTok, so I couldn't tell you about that. Are you on TikTok? No, I'm gonna Kevin wait for hides. the next. He one. hides. Okay, we want to get catch, on the reels. I'm gonna catch the next one. I've been saying that since Facebook, but the next hot one since I'm my gonna since go MySpace. Deep. Yeah, 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 I got you. Um, no, I think the va- the funniest thing is from customers. You know, we're in a hands-on service. You know, it, it is it, it truly is our pleasure to service the community. And some people, you know, they come in maybe after a workout, or you know, we've had you know landscapers come in after they're done landscaping and and hop on a table and you know, with, with all the grass cuttings on them and whatnot. And, that, and that's fine. I mean, it's, we're here to service every part of the population, but I think, and you part got of a little smile ago, Kevin, I think we're going to something here. I mean, part, part of it is you, you just lower the expectations. I mean, you're dealing with, with people and, um, you know, you don't, you can't judge anyone. And, you know, I think the creepiest thing would probably be the dress thing that I can think of where a customer bought a practitioner a dress and asked them to wear it. And that was, 
So what is the future of Stretch Zone look like, right? You, you've got this great growth uh, trajectory. Um, what, what's the kind of the end goal? Is it to, you know, just grow and grow and grow internationally and become a globally recognized brand in, in stretching or um, centralized in the United States? What's the, what's the end game here? Uh, I, th I think it's... It's really impacting as many communities as possible, international, domestic alike. Um, we have been talking to a few different people international. Uh, we're going to international trade show uh, coming up shortly in September, if it still happens. Um, focus on international franchisees. And, you know, the, the goal was always the same from when Jordan first started this, was to, you know, get to the masses and ensure that everyone's grandfather, grandmother, whatever it might be, can have the same experience that his pop-pop did. And I think there's different avenues in which you can do that. And I think first it starts with finding the right franchisee and find the right people that are going to do the proper things and, and, and give back to the communities that have been so gracious to them and so gracious to us. And, and so right now it's about growing uh, systematically. It's about growing the right way. Um, and then, yeah, it's breaching into international and seeing, you know, how many people we can impact. And I think the impact, and this is why I love franchising and I'm so passionate about it, is the, the impact of franchising is not just the clients. It's how many jobs you create from the franchisee and from the, the staff members of the franchisees alike um, and how many opportunities. And, and especially being such a, a, a low-cost franchise is you are able to capture people that aren't necessarily PE groups or people with some serious money or financing, but you're, you're talking to people that are, you know, career nine to fivers that are finally taking that jump and have decided that, listen, I'm going to take, you know, my destiny in my own hands. I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to do my own thing. And, um, and, and that's who we get a lot of. And, and so that's where it's super rewarding. And, and so again, it's just, it's just been doing what we're doing currently, blocking and tackling, making sure that we're, we're finding the right people. We're, we're, we're getting the, the, the service out there. And then, and obviously, and one of the things that we're most excited about is give zone. Uh, which is the charitable arm to our organization. And so we just launched that last year. And, um, you know, that's something where our franchisees are naturally giving back to communities, but it's an umbrella to where everyone can give back and it's something that clients can partake in. So, so there's a lot to be excited about. I like that name. That's an awesome name. Did you come up with it? I partly came up with it. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'm not going to let you get out of this segment without saying plead the fit. So what's your biggest pet peeve of Jordan? <laughs> Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. the biggest pet peeve working with him all these oh, Jordan, Jordy, I mean this is an open book I mean J Jordy and I we I would tell right to his face I mean you know hi him and I are like yin and yang um, as far as personalities you know he always jokes because I'm like data from Star Trek when it comes to you know analyzing certain things and he is such a creative mind and, and Jordan the one thing I love about Jordan is you know we're big on always saying know what you don't know and and Jordan is often you know, joking of the day, he can be sometimes hard to wrangle. And I, I'm such an ops-minded person to where it's, hey, let's be efficient. Let's move the needle. Let's move the needle, whatever it might be. Jordan, I swear, can work on something for 40 hours and come in, and it'll be like a slide deck. And it'll be the prettiest slide deck that you've ever seen in your entire life. And it'll have all these graphics and imagery. And it'll be like, Jordan, did you, just, did you just spend the entire week working on that slide deck? And um, so, so that's Jordan, but you got to love him for it. And So is that your pet peeve? It just takes yeah, too I mean, much time? What was it? Oh, what it's, is? It's, I didn't hear a pet peeve in there. Did you, Kevin? Uh, the pet peeve is, uh, no, nah, he just, sometimes he just, he's, he focuses on these items where it's, you know, it, it's, it's all over the place. And he's not doing it in a bad place, but he's the creator and he's a business dev guy. Um, I'm, not, I'm not picking up that sign to say plead the fifth. Okay, you what's your most hated location? Name the exact location. Which one <laughs> do you just hate the most? Go ahead. There we go. You're determined. Yeah, I am. Um, Don't worry, we're not going to stop there. i got to get you to do it twice so Kevin gets his $200 search on credit. So as far as just geographical? Yeah, the exact location. You know, is the one on Federal Highway in Boca? What is the most hated location that you have in your mind? We all know that one. You have it. Um, what is that location address? There's definitely more challenging locations in, in the country, um, for sure. You know, hate Everything about getting into politics. <laughs> <laughs> he won't break. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm answering your question. I'm not, uh, <laughs> Give us the location or plead the fifth. You know, listen, it's, there's not hate. As far as geographically, there's some that are just a pain to get to. Um, I love Garnett and Sunny and El Paso, or Garnett and Z and El Paso. El Paso is just a tough area to get to as far as travel. I always relate to the most to most disliked as far as the biggest pain in the butt to travel to. Anchorage is probably going to take the cake pretty shortly. 
um, because that that is a far, far flight. Um, So, yeah, El Paso is not easy to get to by any means. Greenville, North Carolina is not easy to get to by any means Um, for for myself. And I guess this is a very selfish selfish view that that I'm taking here. Um, so <laughs> Kevin's like, eh, he's getting around it. Yeah. I What's mean, the name of the, fran- the the franchise? The person who runs that franchise that you don't like? Oh, there's no franchisee that I dislike. No, no. So I was one. I love you, them. I love them all the you, same. You you like the least? No, I love them all the same. Okay, Kevin, he's not breaking. You're not getting your two hundred dollars of credit. Ah, uh, oh well. You're gonna be okay with this? I'll still, I'll still, I'll still, I'll still, I'll still gift you the two hundred dollars. And for, for the record. I will gift you the two hundred dollars, both of you, a stretch on credit, if you go and actually use it within the next month. And so you can talk about it here on the shrimp tank. Mm. Ooh. Down the challenge. Can we re up them? Can we can we re raise them I'm right now? For it. If you are, I'm already stretching. Okay. You know, so I'm oh no no no! no. It's not re- it's not the same. It's not the same. Extra help. Oh, I know. I can't. I can't wait. reach my toes. So you're gonna get. You're gonna help me get there. Yeah, we can take it before and after. Sounds good. Well, Tony, thanks for joining Thank us here on the shrimp tank for Appreciate audience it. listening. You know, if they want to go locally here in Boca, what are some of the locations they could go out to, and what's the best way if they, for, you know, want to get in touch with you or stretch on in general? Uh, for those in Boca, we have locations all over East Boca, West Boca, Palmetto Park, North Federal, Lighthouse Point, um, Pointon. Uh, we're all over in South Florida. The easiest way is to go on to www.stretchzone.com, type in the location nearest you to redeem your free stretch wherever you are in the country. Um, for me, it's you can find me on LinkedIn. It's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Don't try on Facebook. Uh, you're not, not going to find me like Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. So LinkedIn would be the best, but I appreciate it, guys. Um, honestly, this, this, has been, this has been fun. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us on the Shrimp Tank, everyone listening. We'll be back next week at 4 p.m. at Shrimp Tank Boca on Facebook Live. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys.